Welcome to Free Christian Church of God's video outreach ministry, bringing the gospel message of Jesus Christ into your home each and every Sunday morning. If you would like more information about the video ministry or other ministries that we have to offer, stay tuned immediately following this program. And now, open your Bibles and follow along as we bring you today's message. So, uh, some of you participate in our Sunday night services, and a few months ago, I was kind of thinking about the church, our church, and who we are and what we do. And, and I, I've mentioned this before on Sunday nights and maybe even on Sunday morning a little bit. And, and I, I wanted, when, when, when I would come to somebody in the congregation and be like, who are we? As Free Christian Church of God, who are we? And I thought, you know, I would probably get 300 different answers if I asked 300 different people. And, you know, every, every organization has a mission statement. So I thought, what is, what is our mission statement? Who are we summed up into something that people can remember? So I started kind of dissecting who we are as a church. And if you've been coming on Sunday nights, we've been splitting up into small groups once a month. And as ministries, as people who have a certain calling or specific focus on a certain area, say missions, or say you're more of a blue-collared person, we've been dividing up into groups of people who are like-minded, and we've been discussing these topics of who we are as a church. And I just want to walk you through, um, I think there's six of them, six, these six things, and I'm going to focus on one of them today. The other ones we've started to cover, uh, but this one, I, I really wanted to preach this on a Sunday morning. So the first one, we as Free Christian Church of God, we will preach God's word. That's what we do. That's what really, that's what sets us apart from a lot of different places, you know that? We will preach the word. We will. Um, we believe that people are transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's it. That's it. You're not transformed by good music. You're not. You're not. I'll, I'll, I'll say that. You're transformed by the gospel. But when, when we say this, we will preach the gospel, that goes beyond me and my dad. When, when you say we as free Christian preach the gospel, that means you preach it too. That's who we are. That's who we are. Number two, we are the proof of love. We'll serve anybody and everybody. Even if we disagree with their lifestyle, we'll serve them. That's what Jesus did, right? That's part of who we are as Free Christian Church of God. Number three, we believe, some of, most of us believe, in giving until it helps Giving until it helps. Understanding that we are stewards of God's things, not owners. It's not mine. None of it's mine. Uh, number four, this is what I'm preaching on today. We believe we are better together. Amen. We're better together. I'll get on that one later. Number five, we live a life of discipleship. Meaning, you be one, and you make one. Some of you are missing an aspect of discipleship. You're good at being discipled. What are you making? What kind of disciples are you making? And, nah, I'll, maybe next week. <laughs> Number six, then. We devote ourselves to prayer. Being watchful and thankful. And I think that sums up who we are as Free Christian Church of God. You agree? Well, who we should be. It's who we should be as Free Christian Church of God. So today, we believe we are better together because it's more than about me. It's more than about you. It is about His kingdom. It's about His kingdom kingdom. So we live in this day and age where independence is praised. We celebrate our independence. We teach our kids to be independent and not to lean on anyone. And I'm not saying that independence is a bad thing, but sometimes we take it to the extreme and we allow it to leak into parts of our Christian walk and we think that we can exist independent from the church. 
So I want to ask you, how many of you have recently prayed, God, what do you have planned for me? Mostly the young people, some of the not, some of the people going through life transitions. God, what do you have planned for me? I ask that every day because I'm like, I don't have no plans. I just go with it. God, what do you have planned for me? What did I get from the service? What am I here for? Or even, God, give me the ability to confront this or to do that or to serve here. And and I want to ask you this question. I want you to pay attention and really be honest with yourself. How many times do we pray for God to make us useful, independent from the church? God, what do you have for me? I know what they got going on, but what, what's, what, how do you pray? God, give me my thing. Give me my thing. And really, aren't we asking for God to kind of set us apart from the body in, in a lot of those requests? What if we ask God, what are we here for? Like, what are we here? What can we do? Are we taking advantage of all the things that God has set before us? Maybe he won't give you the ability to do something because he's given someone else that ability and you refuse to understand what community is. Yeah, but I want to be this. No, so-and-so's that. Come alongside them and be who God made you to be. It fits that way. It works that way. So Romans 12, 3 through 8 says, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, Amen? And each member belongs to the others. Whoa. Whoa. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully, period. It doesn't say if you feel like it or if you have the time. It doesn't say that. Do it. Just do it. Now, this is an exercise. I did this in youth, and I think it'll be fun because a lot of you are married. So I want you to turn to the person next to you. I want you to look at them. Go ahead. Everybody's participating. Look at them. All right, I want you you to say this phrase to them. All right? This will be easy for some, hard for others. I need you to say this to them. I need you. (laughs) See all the married couples, how they start chuckling? (laughs) I love that. I didn't have that in youth. It was my leaders that chuckled. Was that easy? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) For some of you, it was easy because you're like me. You're pretty confident that this world couldn't survive without you. (laughs) Right? Right? So whoever, whoever said that, that was easy. You're the dominant one in your marriage, probably. Or you're a boss at work. Or you think you're the boss at work right? You know your abilities. Chances are you're a pretty independent person or arrogant, maybe. I don't know. And, and, and I bet that, um, well, here's, here's this, this is, and this is because I'm this type of person. We, we have a hard time, uh, we, we don't have a hard time telling people next to us that you need me because people like us, we, people like us, we have a hard time Letting people help us, right? Because you need me, right? I don't really need you. And, and here's, here's, our, here's our fault, and I'll let you finish my sentence here. We will just do it ourselves because we want it done our way, our way. right? <laughs> it's simple. We want it, we want it done right, and you're not going to do it right. I'm, the, I'm that way. I'm that way. I get it from my dad. I get it from my dad. You should, you should see it. Mike sees it. Oh, my goodness. He has a good way. I have a better way. It's no big deal, you know. <laughs> no big deal, right? 
All right, so the, the people like us who we can turn around and say to somebody, you need me, we're going to have a really hard time with this next one, all right? Turn to your neighbor now. I want you to say this. Guess what? Guess what it is? I need you. Say it. Go ahead. Try it. In. See, see how the chuckles were like smaller? Because you were like, oh, I only said it because we're in church. It's the only reason. I could, I could totally survive without you. My, my wife one time, oh, I can't believe I'm going to say this. We, we, was talking about, we was talking about dying. Because, you know, that's what you do when you're married. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she said, well, if, if one of us had to die, Jimmy, I want it to be you. And you know, I'm like, like as the provider of the family, I'm thinking, what's up with that? Like, you, you, can, you think you can live without me? <laughs> and she goes, no, 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 I just can't imagine you raising two girls by yourself. <laughs> I said, oh, no problem, I'll remarry. <laughs> you, know, you know you've all had that. If so, I went and got life insurance because I, you know, I just didn't know. I just didn't know. So when you looked at the person next to you and, and you said, I need you, did, did you really mean it? Did, did you really mean that? See, some, some people are the needy part of the body of Christ. And I'm not saying that if you, that wasn't a struggle for you, you're needy. But um, some, some people in the church think we have just too little to offer. We're not really good at anything. And if I can just say it, some people in the church are lazy. You're just lazy. And you need people because you're not going to do anything. I mean, I, I remember Dad preaching on it uh, uh, before. If everybody in the church served like you, would we even have to open the doors? Or would anybody even show up to open the doors if everybody served like you? But we all have value. We all have something to offer. Without me, the team will fail. Without you, the team will fail. Because here's the thing. God's plans are far too big for me. Amen. And God's plans, yeah, thanks, Sharon. And God's plans are far too big for you. And God's plans are far too big for us. So what he does is he fills a community of people with his spirit to accomplish things far beyond what we could ever imagine. Amen? So how is it some people can completely exist outside of the church without the rest of the body? You don't. So, you, so some of you will leave here today and we won't see from you or hear from you until next Sunday at 10.30. How did you live? I mean, I'm pretty sure, like I, I'm, not, I'm not into object lessons and it's a good thing when you're talking about the body of Christ because if I was going to show how someone is detached from the church, it would be a bloody mess up here. And I'm not going to do that, but you get the picture. If you're the arm and you don't come back, and you don't mingle, and you don't pray, and you don't seek out your brothers and sisters in Christ, you are handicapping the body. So, if you can survive outside of the church without the rest of the body, you're not part of the body. Well, Jimmy, I, you know, you just got to understand, I just kind of do my own thing. No, no, no. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about his kingdom. Kingdom. Not, not free Christian church of God. Kingdom. It's bigger than us, church. Way bigger than us. Hebrews um, 10, 24 through 25 says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing. <clears throat> I lost my spot. Let me read that again. 
how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting to, I didn't really lose my spot, okay? Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. It's a habit that you miss church. It's a habit that you don't gather together with other believers and spur one another on. That's a bad habit. But encouraging one another, and all the more, as you see the day approaching. There's an ancient proverb that says, when you run alone, you run fast. When you run together, you run far. I got a little video that I want you to watch, just real quick, all right? It's just like four minutes, so. Most of you have heard that one of the Blue Angels pilots was killed this week in a, in a practice, uh, one of the practice sessions. He crashed. And uh, Wednesday I had, had finished this up and decided this was what I was going to preach, and Thursday was when that took place. And, and uh, you know, I kind of tossed around, how do, you, how do you deal with this now? Like, how do you 
adjust, adjust because of the tragedy that happened. And, and I was thinking this morning, you know, the tragedy that happened does not diminish what that team did. But what it does show us is the reality of the risks that they take as a team. Uh, so the, the Blue Angels are one of the most amazing teams you will ever see in your life. And uh, they're going to continue doing air shows I read this morning um, because you don't just quit when things don't go your way, right? But I guarantee you that as precise and dedicated as those boys are and, and the rest of the team that works, they took it up a level after Thursday. I guarantee you they took it up a level. So the, the Blue Angels are obviously very well-trained, very disciplined. At some points in their show, they fly 18 inches apart at up to 450 miles per hour. That's faster than you drive, Lisa. That's crazy. <laughs> but I was so fascinated by the Blue Angels in their videos that I started to dig a little deeper into the methodology of, of how they make things work. And get this, all of the principles of the Blue Angels are biblical principles. Now, I don't think that was on purpose, but that's why it works. That's why it works. They understand what is at stake every single day. Every single day. And here's the thing. 18 inches apart at 450 miles per hour. We can't even worship 18 inches apart, right? We well, said, give me my space. Give me my space for worship. I need to need, look at us. Look at this. Look how spread out you guys are. And that just, I don't know. Think about it. So how serious do you take this team that we're on? If one person doesn't perform at the top of their game, someone loses their life. There's no reset button when you're flying that fast. That's what we learned this week. But see, church, that's really no different than us, except for one big thing. And I'm not trying to dismiss, it is a tragedy. But when we miss the mark, church, it's someone's eternity. It's someone's eternity. So there's 12, 13 principles that, that I went through, and some of them I'm going to spend a little bit of time on, and other ones we're just going to fly over. But number one, there are over 100 people required to pull off this show, this performance, every week to fly the Blue Angels. No one can slack. So you, you think your job in the body of Christ is unimportant. Is it? Maybe, maybe to the body of Christ, you're the one who checks the rudder, and no one sees you check the rudder. But if it's not done to the highest level, it will be catastrophic. Absolutely. Every day, there is a standard. Each and every day, a high standard on every single level of what takes place. If you slack in some areas, you will slack in anything. If you lack in serving, you're going to start to lack in love. If you lack in love, you'll slack in commitment. And guess what? It's going to be hard for someone to call on you when the plane needs examined. If you slack at one thing, one thing, our standard is here on every level, every day. No matter what we do in the kingdom of God, every day, it's all we got to the highest level. Number two, everything is built around a central point. With most things happening at 400 miles an hour, it is critical that everyone on the team has the same central point. If one plane's coming at 400 miles towards another plane at 400 miles an hour and their central point is 18 inches off, 
you have tragedy. Church, what is our central point? It is Christ and only Christ. It is not the church of God. It is not worship music. It is Christ. When you come to church, are you coming with Christ as your central point? Or are you coming to get him back to the central point? Because let me tell you why it's so important to come with Christ as your central point. Because you might fly into this narthex 18 inches off and run into someone else whose central point was Christ. In everything we do, Christ must be central. We feel like we can come with our minds on our jobs or on money or on our kids or on our work or on sports and still accomplish great things. But church, we will go nowhere unless we all, all, all means all, and that's all, all means, all have Christ as our central point, not just in church, but at home, at work, on your way home from work, all the time. Same central point. Number three, the team is built around the same values. They vote every person in or out on their team, and it must be a unanimous decision. So if one person says, I don't want him on my team, they're out. Even if everyone else on the team. Huh, what if we did that in church? <laughs> All right, Kevin, stand up. Anybody want Kevin? I'm just kidding. We wouldn't do that. Would you come if I said we're going to? We're going to vote, vote people in and out on our team because, let's be honest, some of you are ineffective. Maybe some of you are holding the team back. And when it comes to, when it comes to what these guys do, it's, they know it's life or death. And if they have an inkling of doubt in even the guy that checks the rudder, they have a huge problem. They have a huge problem. Number four is they sacrifice individual gain for the team's greater good. Oh, here we go. When is the last time you sacrificed something for the team? We sacrifice the kingdom of God far more often than we sacrifice ourselves for the kingdom of God. Right? Hobbies, sports, TV, jobs, money. Do you ever ask yourself when an opportunity is presented, how will this affect the kingdom? Ever ask yourself that? Oh, I hate my job, but how is this going to affect the kingdom? How is this going to affect the kingdom if I, if I, if I quit? Well, how is it going to affect the kingdom if I don't show up to church on Sunday nights? Or Wednesday nights? Or prayer time? How is this going to affect the kingdom that I'm not showing up? I mean, I'm pretty sure if one of the pilots for the Blue Angels missed the morning meeting, they'd have a problem with it. I'm pretty sure they would have a problem with it because of what is at stake. Church, what's at stake for us and others around us? Eternity. Eternity. During the two-year assignment that these pilots fly, they brief, eat, sleep, exercise, and relax together the whole two years. Trying to focus on perfecting the thing they do. Every day, they're together. Every day. Number five, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one. They represent the team at all times 24-7. Hmm. Do you represent the kingdom? You, you call yourself a believer. You walk into this world. You represent the kingdom of God everywhere you go, even when no one is looking. Even when other church people aren't around, you represent the kingdom of God. Number six, they tap into the strength or the value that every person brings. Every person has a value. If you're not doing something in the kingdom of God, something's not getting done. Something's not getting done. 
Number seven is they communicate both vertically and horizontally. Now that's kind of cool. And if you're here on Sunday nights, we talked about the up and the out of the church. Some of us are really good with the vertical communication. We praise God and we'll pray and we'll come for the message. But when it comes to the horizontal part of our relationship with God where we mingle with other believers and we witness to unbelievers, that part's missing. Or some of you are really good at mingling with unbelievers, but your relationship with God isn't really where it needs to be. But in order for this team to function successfully, we all have to communicate both vertically and horizontally. Now this next part I really like. They debrief. And I, I think like Sunday night is kind of debrief time for the church. We have service, we have a, a message, and we just kind of all come back having had time to process the message. And a lot of our Sunday nights have been more discussion-based now. And so we kind of debrief. And, and I think this is an area that is really, really valuable. According to a former angel, training is stressful at times. And I imagine when rough spots are encountered, they recognize the problem, they address them, then they move on. They go around the table, and everyone is allowed to bring up what they call safeties. Things they're concerned about, things they want to make sure this person knows they need to step it up. I mean, it only makes sense, right? It only makes sense if you want to get better and perform to perfection, you need to debrief. Hey, step it up. You missed this. You missed that. You need to step it up. And you know what? I've, I've learned that that is okay in every aspect of life except for in church. We're not allowed to tell people they need to step it up in church. Well, you want to play on the worship team? You need to come to church on Wednesday nights. You need to come to church on Sunday nights. Wow. Seriously? Like, you get mad at me because I'm asking you to attend church? Is you want to be on the worship team? You want to teach? You want to teach our kids? You need to come to church on Sunday nights. You need to come to church on Wednesday nights because the kids need to see you learning also. Oh, you can't ask people to do that. Are you kidding me? How important is what we do? So here's the thing. It only makes sense if we approach people and say, and, you know, some people are terrible at it. Some people are just rude or mean. But we need, to be, we need to be honest with each other, church. When we see each other slacking, I'm going to pray for you because you're missing something. You're missing something. You're not serving. Some of you aren't serving. You're not serving at all. And this is, this is my, I'm stepping on your toes today, yes. Find somewhere to serve, okay? We need teachers. We need teachers for our kids. We need people to pray for our church on Wednesday nights. Some of you don't have anything else you're doing. Step in somewhere. So here's the thing. By tradition, when someone in the Blue Angels are, when a safety is brought up, they are allowed one response, and this is what their response is. I can fix that boss, and I'm glad to be here. <laughs> I think we should implement this in church. <laughs> I think it would be great. So, I'm, hey, some of y'all, you're not serving, okay? Your response don't call me boss, though. That'd be weird. I can fix that, and I'm glad to be here. Mm. How, how, do we, how do people typically respond? Oh, who does he think? He, he has no idea what's going on in my life. I'm finding another church where they won't get on me about not doing anything. Good luck. Good luck. Churches, churches do you know that the, nat like the national average of people who serve in the church is 20%? 20% of the church, people in the church does all the work. And I think we're a little bit higher than that. But let, let's think about this for a moment. Two biggest things in this church's calendar is journey through time, vacation Bible school. Think about that. It requires all of us, most of us. And it's the two biggest things we do. And we're all tired. I mean, we're tired. But it's awesome. Isn't it awesome? Like, we should do Bible school twice a year. I can say that because Dad's not here. Right? I mean, look, look at this church. When we work together twice a year, over a thousand people come hear the gospel message. Maybe we should work together more often. Well, as soon as we take our nap this afternoon, right? I can fix that boss, and I'm glad to be here. <laughs> I'm going to have to try that on Dad when he, when he gets on me about something. I can fix that boss, and I'm glad to be here. <laughs> He'll make me a doctor's appointment. 
<laughs> Number nine, and this is hard for some people. This is hard for some churches. Follow the boss. Oh, one man is called to lead. It's not a board. It's not a congregation. All throughout the Bible, God has called one man to lead a people. Churches run into this problem a lot. When boards start wanting to run a church and they step on the man who God has called to lead the church and it's not going to work. I talked to a pastor this week. Their church attendance is in half. 700 people to 400 people, 350. He said, no one will follow our pastor. Our boards are fighting. They want to do it this way. They want to do it this way. The pastor wants to go this way. And what it's going to come down to is they're probably going to fire their pastor when really what they need to do is clean the board. I don't know. That wasn't in my notes. Sorry about that. But one man is called to lead. He's tasked with flying the maneuver as exactly and consistently as possible. And church, that's hard. That's really hard to be a pastor and to live consistently because we are held to a higher standard. What I preach is the stick I'm going to be measured to. And let me tell you, I don't live up to a lot of it. I'll just be honest with you, I don't. But we do have a consistent pastor. We do. He's very consistent. I lived with him, all right? I know. I'll tell you if he had flaws. He does have some flaws. Eating, that's a flaw. He loves to eat. I could be, if somebody wanted to poison him, it would be easy. <laughs> it would just be really easy. That's a, that's a flaw. <laughs> but, but every day, every day, the lead man has to be consistent or it affects all of us. That's why you pray for your pastors, okay? Because if he falls, we all fall. That's why you pray for your elder board. Because when they fall, we fall. That's why you support the people that are sitting around you. Because if they fall, we fall. This is crazy to me when, when, the, when the boss calls adding power now. The others, by experience and practice, know how far he will move the throttle on the N in now. And they do the same. Let me ask you this. Do you recognize the voice of your leadership in this church? So when, when our pastor says, we're going to go on the G, you're standing up ready to walk. Do you recognize that? Or when someone says, we'll go this way, when someone says, you know what your pastor said? You'll say, no he didn't, because I know him. It happens a lot, church. People quit the church because so-and-so said that so-and-so said. And it's not true. And I just want to ask you to take the time to get to know your pastors. It's, it's worth it for you. So you'll know our characteristics. You'll know our weaknesses. You'll know how to pray for us. But you'll know, you'll know when someone's sowing discord among the brethren. You need to know that. What if the church moved in this way? Adding throttle now? What if when the word of God was preached, we immediately moved accordingly? <laughs> like, that's right, I gotta change that. Go, changing. I can fix that, boss, and I'm glad to be here. <gasps> you know, I find even as, as little as I preach, it's so easy to repeat things. Not because we run out of material, because people need to hear it again. What if, what if we just, like, we're going to spend the time on this topic of working together as a kingdom of God, and we did it? What? I mean, think of that. Isn't that crazy? I mean, you, you played, you all, most of you played sports. If your coach said, here's what I need you to fix, and you went out and didn't fix it, what would you do? Sit the bench. 
All right, church? Some of y'all need to be a part of the team. We need you. We really, really need you to be a part of the team. Number 10 is they capitalize on synergy. I had to look this up. The interaction of elements that when combined produce a total effect that is greater than the sum of the individual elements or contributions. Do we capitalize on synergy? Do we capitalize on synergy? When I bring what God has given me and you bring what God has given you and they bring what God has given them, we get Bible school. We get storm conference. We get journey through time. And you know what we find out through things like this? People are good at things we didn't even know they were good at. We also realize that people are just willing to serve even if they're not good at stuff. And that's awesome. We need people to laugh at sometimes. That's good. <laughs> That's great. I, I'm one to try anything. I don't know about you guys. Number 11, they must know the procedure and they must follow the script. Can you see why that would be important? Here's the thing. What's the vision of the church? What's the vision of the church? To win souls to Christ. Make disciples. What's the vision of the church? We know that. We're, we're here to win the lost. And not just win them, we're going to disciple them because we're really bad at that. Oh, so-and-so was saved today. Whew, finally, I'm, I'm done. Oh, no, that's when the work starts. Yeah, somebody gets saved at the altar church. We hug them, we pray them, pray for them, and we're like, man, I'm going home to take my nap. No, we need to take that person to lunch. We need to say, I'm going to be around you because now is when it starts. And here's the Sunday school class you need to go to, and I will take you with me because, man, oh, man, you need to know this. You need to learn this and embrace them, invite them over to our house and check up with them through the week because they're going to have tons of questions, but the church gets really good at seeing the lost pray a prayer at the altar and then leaving them on their own. We can't do that. We cannot do that. Church, we have to have a vision and we have to follow that vision because Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, the people perish. The people perish. And is your vision the same as the church's vision? Don't, don't come in here with your own agenda, okay? Don't do that. You're just gonna mess things up. Jump on board with winning the lost. That pretty much covers it all. That pretty much covers it all, amen? Number 12 is every situation requires a detailed response. Every situation requires a detailed response. You know where that's found? Every situation, here's how you respond. It's in here, guarantee it. It's in here. Know the word. That's why Wednesday nights are important. That's why Sunday school is important. That's why Sunday nights are important. That's why summer Bible studies are important. It's why devotions in the morning are important. It is why filling your mind and heart and life with this is important because every situation in life as a part of the body of the kingdom of God, we must know how to respond in detail. In detail. Number 13, fostering positive attitudes. Man, why do you have attitude problems in the church? Why do we have attitude problems in the church? Here's the thing. Your attitude equals your altitude. You're only going to fly as high as your attitude will let you. So I know, like, that's, that's a, lot of, a lot of little points. But can you see where those are all biblical principles? So church, here's my thing. Like, it's summer, and summer's like break time for church people. We take summers off. 
We'll be a little less committed. We'll come when we want to. We'll tithe when it's convenient. But the, the enemy is still looking for someone to devour. Even when we're taking time off, when we're not participating in a ministry, when we're not giving, when we're not loving, when we're not serving, when we're not in contact with the other believers throughout the week, we're suffering. We're suffering and people are going to pay the ultimate price of eternity when the church don't function like the church is supposed to function. We are better together. Thank you for watching today's message from Free Christian Church of God in Continental Ohio. To find out more information about Free Christian Church of God, or to receive a copy of Reverend James Fry's weekly television program, Your Life, call the church office at area code 419-596-3103 or visit our website at freecog.org and download your copy today.